One of the thoughts that I want to give to you to contemplate on as we begin this message is, once we truly understand how much God loves us, we will in turn live that love in our relationship with others. When you get it right between you and God, it gets you right between others. You can work through your situations. And we're going to give these to you today, and uh, as you can write them in, fill them in if you choose to. Uh, as I start, number one, it is Christians are to love, are to love modeled on the love of God to us. Christians are to love modeled on the love of God uh, to us. We are called upon to not only receive love, but to give love. And Jesus said, if you're my disciple, the world will know it because of the love you have one for another. It doesn't mean we always agree on everything, but we can agree to love one another and to, and to be forbearing with one another. And he calls us, I mean, this passage of scripture here, when he simply says to us, uh, be imitators, uh, you know, the, the idea is uh, uh, to model. And, and the imitation of God is a logical, logical concept of knowing God. Uh, we can't we cannot uh, follow the pattern of God if we don't have a relationship with God. You can't do that. You know, and, and so Paul is saying, be an imitator of God. In other words, how did Jesus live? What did Jesus do? How did Jesus respond? His disciples learned from him. And they were constantly, even after Christ ascended to heaven, they were living for Christ, but there were times when they had to remind themselves, hey, wait a minute here, I didn't get it right this time, I'm getting it right this time, because I'm going back, I'm going to repent, I'm going to ask God, He's going to help me. And that's one of the things about being a Christian, is that we don't always get it right, but we can make it right. We can go back and we can repent, we can, we can rebuild relationships and, and do things for Christ, because you know, I've told you all along, Christianity doesn't claim to be a perfect religion. It claims to worship the perfect Christ. It's Jesus we worship. And He becomes our role model. He becomes who we are. And we need to understand that God is love. In Romans 5 and 8, but God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before we were able to love God, God loved us. That's what it means. It means that before I, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior, God loved me. The 139 Psalm says, the Psalm says He formed me and fashioned me in my mother's womb. And I am marvelously and, and fearfully made, wonderfully made by God. And guess what? It's for all of us. And, you know, when you look at me and you see me, you can say some things about God's quality. One thing, He has a sense of humor. You know, and, and, you, and you, you can see that uh, in, 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 in some of these things that happen. And so we are to not only receive that love and salvation, because when we give our heart to Jesus Christ, we receive the love of God, the mercy, the forgiveness of God in our lives. That's the marvelous thing. But we're to walk in love. And walking in love is not just a one-time event. It is an ongoing experience as Christians. We're to walk in love. It doesn't mean we always get it right. Sometimes... We kind of don't get it right, you know, and you know, and, and we need to understand that. We need to be forbearing with one another. You know, if you set a standard for somebody, you're going to be able to live up to it yourself. Amen. It's that simple. But forbearing spirit means to be patient with people to help them get through their situations because somewhere down the road, somebody's going to have to help you get through yours. And so we're to walk in love. And, and, and the word there, of course, is the one that you're familiar with, agape. And it's a godlike love which loves with a pure giving of the self for the well-being of the one to whom the love is shown. You give because you love and you receive, you give out. It's a lifestyle choice. And this love is not based on merit. You don't have some kind of a, a point system where you can reach a certain place. Well, you know, I did good today, God. I, you know, out of 14, I got 11. <laughs> I'm up there. I'm almost. At, I'm at an A minus. You know that's great because last week I was at a C. And the week before that, I failed the course. So God gives to us that sense of understanding, and He offers, also says that it's a fragrant offering, an incense for the temple of God in heaven, pleasing to the Lord. It's a sense of understanding. You know, in the temple in Jerusalem, they they offered uh, incense on the altar so that when their gifts went up to God, there was also that smell. And, and some church traditions, they still use incense in their worship and they, as they worship God, and that's fine. And it's an idea, though, but that which is external is not what Paul was writing about. Go here. He's talking about how your attitude and your heart is toward God, how my attitude and my heart is toward God, and how that carries over in my relationship with others. And he talks about the that Jesus' death is a, was a fragrant offering on behalf of our salvation. Jesus died 
to save us from our sins. Man, what a great gift that was. When he died, they said, Lord, it's finished to testify. It's over with. It was like when he died again with the Spirit, can you say, release the Spirit? It was just like incense before the Father. Wow. That's it. You stuff in it. That's good. And then number two, con we contrast between uh, the sense of uh, in our lives between love and lust. And there are three manifestations of self-indulgent, perverted lust. Now, lust is a point of control in our lives. It can, if some people are made like think, okay, well, that's, that's moral failure. Well, that's one area of lust. Here's some other things of lust. Chocolate cake. You know, chocolate cake. You know, chocolate cake's good. But, you know, you have one piece of chocolate cake, and then, you know, that's good. And you want another right away, you get another piece of chocolate cake, and you have maybe a little queasy afterwards, a third piece, and then that don't taste good going or coming. And so it's a sense of anything that takes control and masters over us in place of God. That's, that's what he's talking about there. And so he talks about that, that concept uh, of that, that there are three manifestations of self-indulgent, perverted lust. And here they are. Number one is immorality. And that is a sense of understanding that doing things outside of, of the law of God uh, concerning relationships between husbands and wives. And the next one, though, is, that comes down the line is the word greed. And the word there means to coveting or any desire of the heart. It could be for an object. It could be for a position. You may want somebody else's position. You want them to mess up. And, you know, people who become greedy, they, uh, you know, Proverbs says, the greedy man says, eat and eat all the time. He's trying to calculate his mind. Oh, great day. They have one more help. Help it. I'm in the red. You know, and, and it could be anything that controls you in your life. And in one with greed comes such things as coveting. You know, somebody gets a brand new car. Look at my car, you know, that's great. And he says, oh, I'm so glad for you in the back of your mind. said, how come I can't get one of those? You know, if, if whatever coveting is in our life is looking and thinking what the other person has. And I remind you once again that the old adage, the grass is green on the other side, more manure. And so, you know, sometimes when people think, I, if I could do that, I'd be better off in that situation if I was in that. And, and they're not looking for God's will in their life. And, and greed is something that controls our society today. I mean, how many people have fallen for get-rich-quick schemes? How many? You know, if you send me this money, you know, I'm going I'm to get this to you, and you're going to get rich. And the only people who get rich are those that you send the money to, you know. And, and, and all of that comes oftentimes acts of crime and, and things like that. And then the other word is vulgarity. And, and the word vulgar means common language. That's what it originally meant. That's the reason why the Latin translation of the Bible is called the Vulgate, which means the language of the people uh, that St. Jerome translated. Uh, but the word has taken on a different connotation. Vulgarity is the use of swear words and languages that are not to be coming out of the mouth of a believer. It's that simple. You know, and, and we as Christians, we need to understand that, that filthiness or baseness or silly talk, when he's talking about silly talk or, or foolish talking, he's not talking about telling a joke and having a good laugh. He's talking in relationship to the idea of, of those things that, that tend to either degrade others or degrade ourselves or point out to things that a child of God should not be, be dwelling on. Okay? And so he gives to us this concept of believers that we are to live a life that pleases God. And, and Paul uses this illustration number three. Paul makes an emphasis on the light of God. The light of God in our lives. And, and this is something that we have to keep the flame burning. In God's revelation of Thanksgiving, in, in, in opposition to that being cost occupied by certain things that are perverted in our lives. And we live in a perverted world. I mean, turn on the TV, turn on the internet, everything you turn on. What, what, what is the most, most prominent thing that goes on in, in, uh, in, in entertainment today? Famous people talking about their immoral lifestyles. It used to be that they were, there were scandals, that people lost their careers over that. Now they broadcast it, they tweet it, they put it on, they put it on uh, Instagram. Anything else they can get on to, you know, just proliferating the, their lifestyle that is in, in violation of God's law, and people are applauding that. And we need to realize that as Christians, we are not of that persuasion as Christians. I, I know this is kind of... Uh, straightforward, but it's time that we uh, dealt with sin and dealt with the idea that uh, we're living in a sinful world and we're in this world, but we're not of this world. You know, we, we, we're citizens, we have, we have our driver's license and, and passports and things like this, but you know, our kingdom is, is not of this world. That one day, our kingdom will rule this world. You see, that's the thing. One day, 
God will rule this world. Because he said, I'm going to him. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And so it's, we, Paul talks about walking in the light. And God's revelation and thanksgiving is opposed to constantly occupied with the things that are negative in this world. And the rule of the peace of God in your life frees you from these lifestyles that leave you feeling condemned or, or feeling uh, convicted or making you feel lousy and, 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 and causes you to not be able to grow in your spiritual life with God. If, if, if your account with God is not right, your attitude toward others won't be right. Your actions won't be right. So God calls us to live a life of faith in Christ. And because in verse 5, when we were reminded of it again, for this you know with certainty that no more or impure person or covetous man who is an idolatry has an inheritance of the kingdom of God in Christ. And Paul tells us to walk in the light. Now I want you to think about this. Which would you rather do if you're walking down a city street in an area, would you rather walk down that street in the daytime where you can see clearly, or would you rather walk down at night where only you have a street light here and a street light there and you can't see what's in the shadows? Common sense tells you you want to walk in the light. You can see clearly. When you walk in the light, guess what the Bible says? You're walking in Christ. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. This is a perpetual relationship with God that will bring you through these times. And, and he talks to us concerning this in our lives and, and how that God calls us to live in that light, the light of God's counsel, God's word. That's why he, he has given to us this book called the Bible. It's not to be used when you need it, you know, you know, it's not like you get a bad report and you start looking for loopholes, you know. Uh, but it's to live as the information that you need, how to live successfully in Jesus Christ, how to overcome battles, walk through grief, walk through fear, deal with loneliness, isolation, all the problems that we as individuals face in our life. This book tells us how to get from where we are to where we need to be which is in the presence of the Lord for eternity. That's scripture. That's what, you know, and, and if you love Jesus, you want to live for Jesus now, and you want to enjoy the fellowship of Jesus in your life now, because it's edifying, it's nourishing, it's spiritually a building in your life. It develops in you good character traits. It gives you a sense of purpose. It gives you a sense of, of security. Because when you read God's Word, or, and when you, now you're on your phones, I got it on my phone, you know, you have, uh, the Bible app, I can listen to it, and, and I listen to it, and, and then, you know, praise and worship, all of these things are edifying, like we did in service today. One of the greatest ways to overcome problems in your life is to get into God's Word and to praise the Lord through the Word. Sometimes, you know, the book of Psalms is a psalm book, okay? And... The good thing is we got the words. The great thing too also is because we don't have the music and the, and the meter. Guess what? We can make up our own music melody with it. Well, I'm not that good of a sin. That's okay. It's between you and the Lord. And what he hears because he loves you is a sweet melody from your heart to him. And that's what God says. Walk in the light. Walk in a relationship with me. And, and, and don't let the enemy deceive you by causing you to let things around you or circumstances happen to you take from you that blessing of walking in the light. Then number four, Paul tells us to live according to the will of God. That's the next one. Live according to the will of God. And that is very important in our lives as believers. Because darkness represents ignorance, sin, moral failure, ruin, deception, spiritual death, all the above. But light represents righteousness, moral purity, and spiritual life, and all of heaven above. It's powerful in our lives that when we choose to follow Christ, it's not just to say, well, I've got fire insurance. We choose to follow Christ because the lifestyle is much more beneficial than lifestyle. Well, I'm not living for God and I have a great time. Enjoy it. It's short lived. But I can have a great time living for God and I don't miss anything. And there's not a thing that I really would want to do because God gives me the desire for the things that are beneficial for me to do. And by far, that's a far better way to live than to live that life of insecurity, to live that life of, of not being able, when you go through a test or a trial, you're fully afraid to be able to go to God and say, Lord, I know you're with me. Yes. 
That's walking in the light. And knowing the will of God. When you walk in the will of God, then whatever you deal with in life, God has a plan and a purpose. And in the end, and see, that's the big picture. In the end, it all works to God's glory and our good. I mean, think about it. I mean, we, we live in the present, and actually in our human experience, we're, we're concerned about our lifestyle here upon earth, you know, and things, good things happening. But just think, just this past week, I think at least three or four people were beheaded by Boko Haram because they were Christians. Came into the village, did this, this destruction of the village, and took three of the leaders out and cut their throats. Do you know what happened when that happened? I mean, nobody wants that. That was a horrible thing to experience. We need to pray for God to give deliverance. But the moment that their heart stopped, their eyes opened to the face of Jesus, who, by the way, is the first martyr of the church. And so we look at this and we see this experience in our lives. And we find this growth. And number five, Paul tells us the Christian lifestyle is one filled by the Spirit of God. Isn't that great? We're not trying to live this to meet God's standard on our own. The Holy Spirit, he's called the counselor, comforter. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. And it comes from understanding that the will of the Lord is to gain wisdom in opposition to being unwise or lack of wisdom. The word Sophia means wisdom. And us, Sophia, means no wisdom. And James 1, 5 through 8, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally to all and upbraideth not. But let that man ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave upon the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord, because a double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. Jesus said this way, you can't serve me and serve the world. Now, he's not saying, you know, you know that what he's saying is simply, it's, it's all or nothing. What is the profit of man if he gains the world and loses his own soul? I mean, you know, I don't care how, you know, great kings ruled and had all kinds of wealth. Didn't keep them alive in the second owner. You know, you may have a better quality of life than somebody else, but if you don't have eternal life, you have no quality here or ever. And I think that's very important for us to understand. He said, don't get drunk and filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, he contrasts that to, when you read that to, to a staggering drunk, singing one of his inebriated songs off key and out of meter, walking down the street, as opposed to the believer singing a heavenly song. Be filled, the word there means be filled up complete, is significant for four reasons why he uses that word filled in Greek. First of all, it's an imperative. An imperative in Greek means a command. And say, you know, maybe you all want to consider, he says, be filled. He's saying, here, don't, don't play games. Be filled with God's spirit. It's a prayer which refers to all of those of the church he was writing to. Not just the pastor, not just the elders, but to you as well. God wants you filled with his spirit. And then it is passive in that it, it simply is this. Be willing to let the spirit fill you. You see, you don't go and say, I'm going to get filled. The spirit comes and fills you. And being open and obedient to the Holy Spirit is the means by which we find it in the present tense that it carries an ongoing effect. That what happens to you doesn't stop. You say, I got, man, God touched me Sunday. I got saved. And, and, and man, that was great. And, you know, now this is next week. Do I come back and say, you know, it's an ongoing effect. Jesus forgave you for your sin. Now the Spirit is cleansing you through the work of His Spirit. First John 1 and 9. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The, the, the Greek in there is with ongoing effect, initial ongoing effect. You're walking as a Christian of God. And there are four great blessings that come to the believer. There are three, four great blessings that come to them. That's, that's uh, in number five. And this is where we write them down. And, and they are, first of all, um, uh, saining. Number one or number A on your list there. To instruct the church to bring praise to God. Saying, when we were, when we were filled with the Spirit and the blessing of the King, when we were singing these songs today, do you know that we were obeying Scripture? We were singing unto the Lord? We weren't singing to be heard by people. I hope not. We weren't saying to somebody, said, boy, you got a good voice, man. I wish I had a voice like yours, because that'd be coveting, you know. But we're singing unto the Lord. Isn't God worthy of our singing? And he, and he talks about this. And, and, and he talks about psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. You see that, 
that method of worship, all areas of music and worship blended together. And you know, when you think about this, the Bible talks about in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, Revelation it says they, that from every tribe, kindred, tongue, and people, they sing a new song to the Lord. Can you see how that all these different dialects, all these different people are before the throne of God from every kind of, of, of lifestyle that they've been redeemed from, from every kind of ethnic group. And as they begin singing, the Holy Spirit as the, as the maestro, as the angelic choir, uh, the, the musicians of the and symphony of angel, angelic symphonies begin to start playing the music. And all of these people from every nation begins to sing and we can understand and it blends before the throne of God with the most magnificent melody that we will never hear in this world and will always experience in the world to come. That's a great experience of singing unto the Lord. You can sing to the Lord in your shower, in your car. You can sing to the Lord walking through the house. You can sing, you can sing songs that you know, hymns, or you can even make up songs of praise that the Lord just gives you, that you begin praising the Lord. And then along with that comes overflowing joy. Now singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs uh, it's singing in the spirit and the understanding as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14 and 15 I was saying in the spirit I was saying with understanding he, he's writing there concerning the overflowing joy of God now overflowing joy doesn't mean that you're always happy see a lot of people think the joy is, is, is that and we're not talking about being happy because happy is an emotion that can be predicated on situations and circumstances joy is there whenever everything else is going to pieces joy is there when you're shedding a tear because joy is based upon your relationship with God and the certainty of that relationship. It doesn't mean you won't cry in sorrow. It doesn't mean that you won't have times of discouragement. But joy strengthens you, according to what Nehemiah says, on your worst day in the core of your being, when you say, you know what, I'm going to toss in the towel. I, I can't go any further. Joy is like that core a, a, a center of who you are that simply says, no, you're not. Because you know your Redeemer is alive. And you're going to win. Joy is strength to your life. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah says. It's a sense that you can grow in your faith in Jesus Christ that way. And then along with that, he talks about an attitude of thanksgiving. An attitude of thanksgiving. It's to replace an attitude of grumbling and complaining. You know, the thing that prevents us from entering the promised land of God's promises for our life is grumbling and complaining. That's what happened to the Israelites. They got to the land and they said, we're going to have to fight some battles. They said, oh, I don't want to fight no battles. But there's locusts and wild honey. There's, there's uh, fruit abundantly. We're going to move into homes we didn't even build. You know, the, look at it. We even brought back the evidence. I ain't going to go over there. I don't want to fight the battles. And... Instead of being thankful to God, God, you got us out of slavery and you got us into the land of promise. We can cross over now and take it. It took 40 years until the next generation came along. And you see, oftentimes that attitude of thanksgiving is something that we have to have a discipline to do. There are some days we don't want to be thankful. And let me tell you something. On days when you don't feel very spiritual, that's when you do need to make yourself do it out of discipline. Because the reason why is not because your attitude is because of what you know. Joy is that center core in your life that gives thanksgiving because you know what God has said and you know God keeps his word. Now the devil would like for you to, to not listen to that because he would much rather you live a life of, of defeat. And you're, there are times when you're hurt and there are times you're going to have to heal. And then humility, mutual respect and submission to the body of Christ. We need to honor one another as we would the Lord in the sense that there's our brother, our sister in the Lord. We need to love them. In Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 through 20, it says this, and we're getting ready to close. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. They will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. I, I like that phrase, an undivided heart. Jesus says, follow me and don't look back. Luke 9 and 63, follow me and don't look back. And see, we need to do what Paul tells us to do in Ephesians 5, 10 through 20. Quick rundown. Don't, don't participate in, 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 in unfruitful deeds of darkness. Uh, don't even talk about them. Um, God will expose it. Arise and shine. Arise and shine. Remember, we've got a little rag up here that they can put it on your forehead and you can walk out shining. <laughs> And doing that. Okay. Then it says, uh, be careful how you walk. In other words, who you keep company with. First Corinthians chapter 15 says, be cautious. 
bad company corrupts good morals. So we need to walk. We can love people, but we don't need to let them influence us. We need to influence them in the kingdom. And don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You know, and that's where you read the word, that's where you come to church, that's where you pray, that's where you seek scripture, that's where you seek counsel of those in the Lord or over you. Uh, things like that. To, and be filled, don't get drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. Sing these songs of praise and give thanks. Have a thanks attitude. So here's what he says right down the list here. And you know, to round down, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown. Don't let, don't take part in unfaithful deeds of darkness. Just don't take part. Don't, don't associate with stuff like that. Well, it won't hurt if you go. Well, it could hurt if you go. And why would you want to even take the chance? You know, have you ever seen a cliff? You ever seen a, a barrier there that says, danger me on this point, don't step over? Have you ever heard of somebody stepping over and what happens to them? They didn't read the sign? You know? It's a sense of understanding it. It said, don't even, don't, uh, don't take part in that. If they're going to do something wrong, you, 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 go, you go someplace else. Get away from it. Don't speak evil because God will reveal motives behind it, what you're doing. And He will call the darkness into light. And guard your walk and your talk. The Bible says, power of death and life is in the tongue. He said, praise the Lord. I don't like that person. Let me tell you what a skunk he is. That's not the life of a believer. You know, we need to understand that. And don't be foolish. Seek to understand God's will. I mean, it's not like that God says, guess. What you will, God? I ain't going to tell you. <laughs> Mess up, and I'll tell you then. God says, here it is. Know my word. Guard your walk and talk. Don't be fully seek to understand God's will. Don't get drunk, but be filled with God's spirit. Make a melody of song to God in your heart, even when you don't feel like singing. Give thanks to God in every situation. It doesn't mean that you like every situation. i got to tell you, there's some situations that stink. So how do you thank God in that situation? You thank God that if you're going through it, you're not going through it alone. Because he said, I'm going to leave you, I won't forsake you. I don't like some of the roads I've walked down the last few years. Some of them I hate. But my thanksgiving has not been based upon what I'm going through, but the fact that he's going through it with me. That's what life is all about. Whatever you're going through, you may not like what you're going through, but you can be thankful that God's not making you go through it by yourself. Give thanks to God in all situations, and above all, accountability. One of these days, we're going to stand before God, and I, I believe that we're going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. But we're going to fight some battles, but that's not something we ought to be in despair about. We ought to say, it's not so hard to go into battle when you know the outcome. You know that? You know, it's, it's kind of like a person putting on a football game, and he takes bets, but they think they're watching a football game, and they are, but he has satellite, and he caught the game on the East Coast because it's delayed on the West Coast, so he's taking bets. And everybody's saying, yeah, yeah, he already knows what's going to happen. Of course, that guy's a cheat, a crook, but he, but he, he does that, and he, and he gets ahead of the game. Well, we already know the outcome. If you know Jesus, the end result is this. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'm going to come again. And where I am, you're going to be with me forever. So how do you get there? How do you get from here to there? By accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. A simple prayer with the right attitude opens the key. The simple prayer is this. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved. Will you forgive me? I want you to live and be in control of my life. I surrender my heart and my life to you. Have mercy on me. Just a simple prayer like that. If you need the Lord as your Savior, we're going to pray that prayer. And if you, maybe you're religious, maybe you go to church, maybe everything else, but yet in your life you don't have that assurance that if you were to die tonight you'd go to heaven, that you want to not. You can pray that prayer. And after church, if you talk to me or talk to Pastor Stacy over there, She'd like to talk to you about what you've done in Christ. And we're going to pray and ask God to touch you right now.